Welcome to Renaissance. We are so happy that you are here. Whether you're at home or here, we would love it if you would worship with us today.
we could have communion and relationship with you. We're so thankful, Lord.
for sending your son to die on the cross for us. Thank you for sacrificing your only son for us. God, this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit fill each and every one of us and speak to us in different ways that speaks to our soul, that renews us every morning. And we look to you for that strength and that love and that grace. God, I pray that we open our hearts to you to hear what you have to say to us. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Renaissance. If you are joining us online, go ahead and leave a comment and let us know you're watching. We have live hosts ready to engage with you. If this is your first time, we want to get to know you. For our online Ren family, take a moment to go to rendicator.org, click on the church at home link, then look for the button that says, tell us about you. If you're in person, be sure to come and see us. After this gathering, make your way to the welcome station in the gallery. Some of our staff and volunteers will be there ready to serve you. We want to greet you in person and get a gift in your hands to simply say, thanks for joining us today. Wren Kids and student classes are now happening all throughout the building as we get back to some of our regular programming. The 9 a.m. service has gatherings for birth through eighth grade, while the 11 a.m. service offers nursery and toddler. If you are part of our Church at Home family, we have Wren Kids and Wren Early Learners resources available each week. Be sure to join our Wren Families group on Facebook and subscribe to our Wren Decatur YouTube channel to view our Kids at Home playlist. Students and parents of third through eighth graders, this announcement is for you. We have relocated all kids and student check-in stations to the first floor. Now our third through eighth grade students can use the self check-in station located in the first floor elevator lobby. We have done this so you can check them in and drop them off in their classrooms 10 minutes before service starts. Leaders have planned some activities and time for them to connect before joining us for worship in the main room. You will notice we have roped off a student section in the main room where they can sit together with their leaders. We wanna say a huge thank you to all who faithfully serve with us here at Renaissance. Each week, you are making everything we do possible. If you call Renaissance home and are looking to get more involved, we have several opportunities for you to join a ministry team. Great things can happen when we serve together. We might learn new skills or discover new passions. There are always opportunities to use our God-given gifts and we get a chance to meet new friends and make some great connections. We also get to practice being more like Jesus when we serve others. We might serve by opening a door, welcoming someone new, looking through a camera, or loving on kids, but wherever we serve, we get a chance to be a picture of how much Jesus cares for others. These all reflect our core values here at Ren. It's all because of Jesus. Growing people change and loving people serve. We can all strive to follow the example of Jesus individually, but the reality is we're better together. To join a ministry team, come to the welcome station and talk with a team leader today. We will have you fill out a card to get you started. Our Ren Young Adults group meets this week. We will continue meeting at 7 p.m. on the first and third Mondays of every month right here at Renaissance. So whether you are a freshman in college or a 20 something, this is an opportunity for you to create a stronger community here at Ren and grow deeper in your relationship with Jesus. If you haven't signed up yet, doing so will be able to help us plan and update you on the future events that we have for the young adult group. After this gathering, you can grab a young adult card located in the gallery or sign up online and tell us more about you. We'll see you tomorrow night. We realize that you have choices with where to give your money, and we want to take a moment to thank everyone who chooses to partner with us here at Renaissance. Your faithful giving enables us to reach more and do more. If you would like to start giving with us today, you can do that in person by using the giving boxes or the kiosk located throughout the building, or you can give online at rendicator.org backslash give. You can also use our text to give option. Just text any amount to get started. That's what's happening at Ren. Be sure to follow us on social media for content and check-ins throughout the week. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you for being here today. How are you, well? Uh, 
Yes, it's so great to be with all of you. If you're visiting with us, we're going to do a little bit of family business. So this will be strange, but it's okay. It's, it's part of what we do here. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm lead pastor here at the church. And uh, I have some uh, wonderful news for us today. Um, and wonderful by, by mean terrible news. <laughs> by wonderful, I mean terrible. Um, Laramie and Jared, would you please stand to the front so we can throw things at you? No, anyways... Uh, Laramie has been our creative director here at the church um, for many years, been on staff with us. Uh, what a lot of people don't know this is Laramie was actually our first hire as a, uh, at the church. So she's the first employee we ever had. Uh, she came out of Millican with a degree in art, and she could draw really good. And we thought, you know what would be great for the church if we had an artist on staff? <laughs> So we hired an artist, and she's been with us all these many years. And her husband, uh, Jared, um, was part of our Bible study. Both of you guys were well before they were even married, I think. And when Renaissance started in the basement of my home some 12 years ago, they were there. Um, I say all those things just to point to this reality. Miss Laramie and Jared and their family are moving to New Jersey. This is where you go, boo. <laughs> Yes. No, they're moving to New Jersey. She has been offered a wonderful job at a, a larger church out there to truly take to that congregation uh, a lot of the skills and um, things that she brought to this church. And so we, um, we release her to go do that. We are sorrowful and sad in all of that. Um, and yet we are happy for them as well. So we wanted to just take a moment to pray for them and bless them. And we wanted to give you guys an opportunity as well. Uh, you might have saw in the gallery when you walked through, there's a couple tables with some of these cards that you can write thank you uh, to Laramie and Jared. Uh, you can just write a few things to them, uh, maybe a memory you have of them, or just encouragement. Um, to do something like this, to move cross country, takes a lot of faith in the Lord. Would you agree with that? Yeah. <laughs> So if you could give them a kind word that they um, aren't insane, that they are hearing from God, that God is leading them, and um, even though we'll miss them terribly, God is setting them up for success. But just some real encouraging words to them. They'll keep those, um, and they'll read them when everything's get hard, because they'll get hard. They do. And this will be a real encouragement for us as a church to really encourage them. Um, we have a gift for them as well. I say we. I went out and shopped this uh, for you. Um, <laughs> I hope you're not allowed to look at it right now. It's, um, and, yes, and uh, I just want to, I just want to give that to you and thank you. Um, you guys are, <laughs> me and Larry's like, no, um, <laughs> more than employees for sure, um, more than brothers and sisters, I would say friends, and I'm so thankful for you guys. Um, Bless you. Bless you. Um, this is a highly charismatic thing to do, but if you're in that stream of Christianity, would you stretch forward your hand? We're going to pray. Chris, I'm waiting for you. It won't count unless you stick your hand there. Yes. Yes. We did it. <laughs> Miracles do happen. He is alive. So let's, let's, let's pray. Sorry. Let's pray for them. Um, God, thank you for your infinite wisdom. Holy Spirit, you speak to your people in such a loud voice that they understand what you're doing. So we ask, that God, that you continue to bless Jared and Laramie and their family as they traverse cross-country to start a new endeavor, not leaving the kingdom of God, not leaving the church, but moving on to another church. And they will serve that church, God, with the same zeal and fervor and love that they had served this church. God, I pray that you make way for them, that you open even more doors than just vocation and housing, but, but friendships, pastoral care, that they find a real fertile place to grow. All these many years, Lord, of prayer, of leaning in and trusting you, Lord God, I pray that fruit would abound in their lives. God, we release them with the blessing of Renaissance, all of the staff here, and the entire church. We love you guys. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. This is where you guys can applaud. Yes! Yes! So. All right. 
Well, that's it, guys. Let's transition to the next piece. Um, I really thought you guys would stand up and clap and stuff. Anyways, but anyways, uh, God, God bless all of you. Thank you. So if you are at home, we want to say welcome. Also, if, if you didn't get a chance, uh, you're at home and you're like, oh, man, I, I, I'm not out in the guest gallery. You know, I can't write anything. You can send it to, someone help me out with Laramie's email. Is it Laramie at Rindicator? Laramie at Rindicator. Sometimes we do L dot, you know. But Laramie at Rindicator.org, and we will get those to her. Um, and so uh, you, you do have a chance. You're not missing out. Um, I was telling uh, telling him earlier if uh, if you're writing out uh, a check and you need to know how to spell her last name, S T R E E T. So, um, but we want to love them and and bless them. Make sure you you get a chance to do that. But um, uh, so I want to talk this morning, and I hope we're in a place where we can hear it, <laughs> hearing the voice of God, hearing really hearing the voice of God. And um, can we uh, just for a second? Thank our, our worship team. Um, do you guys enjoy the worship that happens on a Sunday morning? There's, a, there's so much work and effort that goes into that. And, and something that you might not even be aware of is that, that they wear these, you um, might see in those little those in-ears. They're called in-ear monitors. And so we don't have monitors on the floor. And so how do they hear, you know, what's going on? They're, they're hearing it in their, in their ears. And What's in their ears happening along with their instruments is this click. It's a metronome. It's keeping pace. It's keeping time. It's keeping everybody together. It's giving direction, right? So as they're singing, as they're playing, this is going. At the same time, there's this thing called the guide. So this click, this metronome is going. It's keeping pace better than me, and that's why we have it. And it's though pretty good for talking and clicking at the same time, right? Okay, I expected a little more applause for that. But so they're having that guide in their their ear, and the, and the guide see that the guide says this intro two three four, and then the yeah right, and then the guitars come in, the the drums come in, right? They know when to start, and the verse chorus. Bridge, ta- so that's all going on in their head. You didn't know how hard they work and how talented they really are and how God is really able to, to use them through all of that. And so they got the click and they've got the guide. And then they've got a, a band leader that will also speak and say, wrong note, no. <laughs> but it, he will help where the guide doesn't. And he will help lead, and he will help direct, and he will help, uh, help them along with transitions and energy and encouragement. And so there's a little, little bit behind it. Kind of cool, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really cool. But there's that inner voice that's happening that's giving them direction, giving them pace, giving them that, that, that voice that's, that's driving them on. And so have you ever had that voice in your head? Or am I the only one that kind of hears voices in my head? No? Okay. So let's, let's, keep, let's keep on talking. Uh, or I'll, I'll keep on talking. You shut up. Okay. So you have, the, you have the inner voice in your head. It's a leading, right? It's prompting you to do something. It could be good, and it could also be bad, right? We have that, that inner dialogue that happens. And is it just me, or does it sound like the same voice? It's the exact same voice. Whether it's good or whether it's bad, it sounds like, like me. So Scripture will tell us that the Holy Spirit speaks to us from the inside. He speaks to us on the inside, to the inside of us. So listen to a few examples out of the book of Acts. Um, Acts chapter 8, verse 29. says this, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go and join this chariot. The Spirit says to Philip, This chariot, it's pretty specific directions. 
right? And God is setting up this divine encounter between Philip in this passage and the Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip is listening to that voice speaking to him on the inside because it's not, not, Jesus didn't show up and say, Philip, it's the spirit speaking to him on the inside. Or how about Paul in uh, Acts 16? Paul and his group is listening to the direction that's that inside voice. The inside is hitting, they're uh, going on their journey. They would be called his missionary journeys, right? And they would, natural human uh, tendencies would be to, to hit all these major influential cities that they're walking on. But that inside voice is telling them to go on is giving them the, it would be called the Macedonian call there in, in uh, chapter 16. You can read about it. So as they're on this Via Sebaste or Sebast, I don't know, I don't, I don't speak that, that language, but it's a road. It's a military road. It's a road that they would use. So as they're, they're hitting these major uh, influential cities along this military road, they, it's a 400-mile journey on foot, mind you, and they're doing it at their direction, at the leading of the spirit of Jesus. Let's pick it up in verse 6 in, in chapter 16. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come to my Asia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. But the spirit of Jesus, the voice on the inside, did not allow them. So the spirit of Jesus, which was on the inside of Paul, told him, don't go there. Yeah, not that city. Keep walking. Don't go there either. Keep walking. It's a 400-mile journey. They're bypassing all these influential cities to go to where the spirit of Jesus on the inside was saying, telling him to go. So a couple of weeks ago, Jen and I, we, uh, we got away, and we're having breakfast, just the two of us. So good. And uh, we're at the House of Pancakes in uh, Champaign. Any, any fans? No? Okay. It's a great, great place. Uh, my first time. But So we play, paid our bill, and... We're sitting there conversing, and that inside voice speaks to me and says, you should be generous. You should give a a gift to this waitress. And it was a voice on the inside. Now, now that I don't think was my voice because I would never come up with something like that on my own. And it wasn't, you know, an evil voice. So it's it's this voice on the inside. So I did what every, you know, probably every husband would do. I turned to my wife and I say, how much money do you have in your purse? Right? And... um, so we're able to, to, to bless this waitress, and, and uh, we're able to pray with her right there in the middle. It was, it was a, kind of a life-changing moment for her, and it was just simple obedience to that inside voice that made a huge impact on the waitress that day. It's that inside voice. Now, I've also been, um, I've been alone at night, Jen and the kids out of town on a trip, and that inside voice speaking to me. You should do something that's going to challenge your, your character. Right? It's, gonna, it's gonna compromise your integrity as a, as a pastor, as a father, as a husband. I didn't listen to that voice, but it sure sounded like that same voice. So maybe that real question that we should, that we should be asking is, how do we sort it all out? Is anybody there? Like, can we... The fact is, not, not every voice that is on the inside is the voice of God. So what is it? There are two strong voices. There's that leading voice and there's that misleading voice. If you'll turn with me, open your, your Bibles to John 10. I'm going to start in verse 2. But he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. That leading voice, the voice of the shepherd, is Jesus. So we have the Savior's voice. The misleading voice is the voice of the stranger here in the text. Now John, who's writing this, assumes that we know the Savior's voice, the shepherd's voice, the leading voice of Jesus, and that we would run from the stranger. But unfortunately, that is not true for, for me, right? It's not true for so many of us. We don't truly know. We don't always know the voice of Jesus, and we don't always run from the stranger. 
Right? A lot of us grew up with stranger danger, and if your name is Chester, I'm sorry, because there's a little rhyme about you that you might not know. But I, he- I heard it described as this, like a dog leash. It can be seen as, as restrictive, right, a dog leash. It, it can be seen as, as chains, as holding me back. My dog will absolutely choke itself out trying to run ahead of that leash. But it's also going to be known as, there's, a, there's another name, bless you, a lead, Right? You can, it can be uh, a lead, and the lead speaks of direction. It speaks of safety. It speaks of destination. A lead speaks of, of protection, of purpose, and care. You're leading. For believers in Christ, the Savior's voice is on the inside of you because Christ now indwells us by his spirit. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 9, it says, You, however, are not in the flesh but in the spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. We are internally being led. He speaks to us on the inside. Now, you may be saying, gear down, big shifter, or or not. I don't know if you use that language or not. But I thought God speaks to us through the Bible, through the Word, through the Scripture. But consider, if you will, how that works. So you have your Bible open. Right, your journal might be situated close beside, and you, you got this steaming hot cup of, of coffee. Right, it's a pour over French press. I don't know your speed, but uh, and, and something just begins to to jump off the page as you read the scripture. Right, it just stands out. It's this illumination that begins to lead to this eternal dia- internal dialogue with God. And maybe there's something about your life, your choices, your lifestyle that doesn't line up with what you're reading in scripture, and there's this conviction, there's this sadness, right? There's, it leads to this, this pause for prayer, and this conversation begins with the Lord, and you're now interacting with him, and he's talking you through the word, and, but the real transformation and the dialogue, the conversation with God that originated with the scripture that you just opened, that's the spirit speaking on the inside, and that's where the real transformation happens. And you might be saying, well, I really... I hear God, and I thought he spoke through sermons. Consider, if you will, how that works. Today, in this room, there's going to be maybe a hundred different sermons preached. Maybe this has happened to you, Jeff, or myself, and maybe your favorite podcast is speaking, and the voice on the inside begins to highlight something, right? You begin your conversation with God, and what you are, what uh, I am beginning to communicate and speak up here, it seems almost secondary. Because now the Lord is speaking. It's probably already happened this morning that the Lord begins to lead you. He begins to give you some direction, maybe challenge you concerning something that you've been walking through. And it it might might not be something that I've said up here, but you're feeling, you're sensing, you're hearing something in your heart and saying, I need to fix this. I need to change this. I need to grow in this area. I can't tell you how many times someone has come up to me after service, and they begin to describe the, the sermon that it was just preached. The problem is I never said that, right? Maybe you've experienced that. The problem is I, n- I never said that, but that's not my conclusion. That's not the point I got to, but the real transformation comes with that dialogue, that conversation that started, right, as God begins to speak. And it originated with this, the sermon. It started with the sermon, but the voice is speaking to you on the inside. It's that leading voice of the shepherd. We have the spirit and his voice on the inside. But there's also the misleading voice. It's what John here, there described as the voice of the stranger. But the stranger, he feels all too familiar. He doesn't feel strange at all. It's annoying. It can be frustrating and it can be slick and crafty. So who is that? Or what is that? Where does that voice come from? Right? It's a, it's a stranger as far as John is concerned. But hopefully it will be a stranger no more this morning when, when we're done here today. So I'm going to introduce you to that voice. You're going to know who it is and you're going to know how to stop listening to it. So let's pray. God, I pray that you would open up your word. God, as we open up your word that you would speak. You're living on the inside. God, for those of us that would call you Lord, you are on the inside of us. And we ask you to speak to us today, God, in only the way that you can. God, that you would cut right to the heart of matters. God, that you would be illuminating, highlighting, instructing, and correcting us. God, we position ourselves right now, this morning, to hear you today. Amen. So, all right, let's get to uh, 
let's get to work. Open your Bible to Romans 7. I call this the doo-doo passage. So let's uh, step right in it. All right? it, is, <laughs> it is, in fact, all about the doo-doo we find ourselves in. Right? Even when we are aware it's there, we still find ourselves stepping in it anyway. So I saw this video this week, and I couldn't help but watch it in context of this, this message this morning. It was, um, even as I was driving in uh, to the office this week, I caught them talking about the same story on the radio. And I'm like, okay, I, I hear you, God. I'm definitely going to put it in the message. But they found this, this sheep. I don't know if you saw it. They found a sheep wandering in, in Australia. And it had been wandering around for, for several years. And it had been tagged, but that identified, owned by a shepherd. But that, that uh, tag had been ripped out. So it had a shepherd at one time, but it had walked away at some point. Its wool coat was, was heavy. It was overgrown. It, it couldn't see. It had trouble uh, even walking around. So they, took, they ended up taking like 80 pounds of wool off of this sheep. They, they estimate maybe five, six years it had been wandering around. It was so burdened. Right? It was so weighed down by being away from the shepherd that uh, it, it listened, if you will, to that misleading voice that it caused the sheep to wander and be vulnerable to the elements. So in shearing... The sheep, wounds and ulcers were uncovered, right, and even made some fresh nicks and as they're, they're shearing the sheep and as they, they work to, to save it, save its life. And the healing process would then begin, and they, they would apply ointment, and bedding and nourishment was provided, and he was uh, in the care of a good shepherd once again. It's maybe important to also note that they called this place an animal sanctuary, where he would find sanctuary. The sheep, you could say, had been listening to that misleading voice. The voice, this misleading voice, we're going to identify him. The Apostle Paul would call it sin. So before we get into seven that I told you to open up to, I'm going to pull a real quick psych moment in the 90s. Anybody grow up in the 90s? (laughs) Okay. So uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 12, before we jump into seven. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. To obey its passions. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Sin is the word harmartia in Greek in the original language. It's, uh, I don't speak Greek. I had to look it up. It's a noun. Previous to this in Romans, it's been used as, a, as the verb hermarton or sinning, right? The act of sinning. You are maybe familiar with Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sinned, it's the act, it's a verb. Um, have sinned, it's the act of sinning. But here in, in 6, it, it's a noun, hamartia. And you remember uh, maybe your first grammar lesson. A noun is a person, a place, or a, oh, yeah, I heard somebody. Not everybody, shame on you. Um, so it's, yes, it's a thing. It's something real. Here Paul is saying that there is sin that wants to reign. It wants to have control. It wants to have power in your life. It wants you to obey its passions. Sin has passions. And it wants to control you, to reign over you, to make you obey them. Right? Another version would say this, and maybe you're like, mine doesn't say passions. It says evil desires. Sin wants you to make you obey the evil desires that it puts in your mind. So what a counterfeit to the good shepherd. Your savior that wants to lead you, that you would know him and follow him. Because he's laid down his life and he has your best interest in mind. But sin wants to reign. It wants to reign, but listen, in your mortal bodies. Did you catch that? Did you read that? In your mortal bodies. Jesus' perspective isn't your mortal body, but your eternal. He has your eternity in mind. So let's walk through some of this passage in Romans 7. Paul's describing here what it looks like when we follow that misleading voice. What that leading astray looks like. And can lead to. This is the, what life can look like if we listen to the power of sin within us. Starting in verse 15 of chapter 7. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Nobody here this morning watching online, right? Nobody can relate to that, right? We're, right? But what I, what I want to do, I don't do. But what I didn't want to do, I end up doing just me. Okay, so verse 16. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree the law with the law that it is good. So after I do something I know is wrong, right? I know it's wrong. I knew it was wrong. I know that. 
but I did it anyway. Verse 17, so now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells with me. So it's in me, but it's not me. Hear this. It's saying it's in you, but it's not you. Sin is in me, but it's not me. This is hugely important. Huge, hugely important here. The power of sin is in us. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Yes. It's in you, but it's not you. It's like we have a, it's not like we have a, a good side. It's not like, hear me say not. It's not like we have a good side and a bad side. We do not have two natures. Scripture is pretty clear on this. If you are an unbeliever, you are in Adam. Right? Adam was the one who, listened, who first listened to that voice of sin. Right? That is your nature. You're lost. You are spiritually dead. Eternally separated from the presence of God. But if you're in Christ, you're spiritually alive. So we're either in Christ or in Adam. You have one nature and one nature only. If you're in Christ, you have his nature. It's who you are. It's at the core of your being. You are spiritually and eternally alive. But we have this voice that's on the inside of us. It's not us, but it's in us. So I've, I've, I've heard it explained like this. If you um, have ever had a splinter in your finger, that's most of us, especially me, my hands are soft. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, I'll stop there. Uh, you have a splinter in your finger. It's in there. It's in you but it's not you, right? It's annoying you, it's frustrating you, but you would never say that that's who you are. The power of sin is in you, it's bugging you, it's annoying you, it's frustrating you, but it's not who you are. You're not fighting against yourself. Maybe you had a sibling or a cousin that used to take your hand and hit you with it. Stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself, right? It's stop hitting yourself, it's not who you are. Or so, that's how Paul is describing it here. So let's read on verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, my flesh. There are a um, couple translations here that actually use sinful nature or corrupt nature instead of flesh. But the actual Greek word, I feel like, hmm, the, the actual Greek word here, <laughs> is sarki. It, it's actually flesh. All right, the reason this is important, because reading that, you, it might make you think that you have two natures, because you're, oh, there, here's a corrupt nature, or here's, here's a seren, sinful nature. But the actual Greek word is flesh, and, fl but flesh, it's not a different nature, right? It's the desire to accomplish something with our own human resources, independent of God. It's your own strength. Paul is saying that he knows nothing good is coming from his own resources, right? Anything good in me is from God. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Right? That, anybody? Like, I, I just keep stumbling. Verse 19. For I do not do the good I want, but the, the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. I keep stumbling. Verse 20. Now if I do not, oh, there's a lot of do's here. Now if I do, I was doing pretty good too. Uh, if I do what I do not want. It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. This has been called the power of sin. Paul is later going to call it the law of sin. Others would refer to this as the indwelling sin because it's on the inside of us. So whatever name you give it, whatever name you, it goes by, it's a strong force and it's that inside voice, that inner voice. It comes as, crosses that first person and you actually think it's you speaking. Right, that night when my family's away and that strong voice sounds like me, you should watch that. You should do that. And it sounds like a tricky little sneak. Tricky, isn't he? But that's that misleading voice on the inside speaking to me. Knowing this, understanding this, it can help us understand a lot of different things. It can illuminate a lot. Jeff talked a little bit last week about those respected once respected, influential Christian leaders that fell into sin. We all wonder, how does this happen? Maybe that's a question you even ask. How does a Christian do that? How do Christians act so unchristian like We all, pastors included, have this, that misleading voice on the inside speaking to us. Paul's admonition here is, do not let the power of sin reign in you, that you would obey its evil desires, its passions, 
So we see them fall, those leaders, and we ask, were they even, <laughs> were they even Christian? Well, of course they were. Of course I am. Of course you are. Will we listen to that misleading voice? So how much grace can we now have? Understanding this, knowing this, how much grace can we now have for people? This people, this people, those people, they're, it's me, it's us. It's each one of us that we're capable of listening to and obeying that misleading voice. We all hear it and we're all tempted. But let's keep reading because Paul is not done yet. Verse 21, so I find it to be a law that when I do what is right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. So he's saying, in my spirit, I love God, I love the law, and I want what God wants. But verse 23, check it. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Here's, here's where he gets, wretched man that I am, verse 24. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Wretched man that I am. So I want you real quick to go ahead and count up all the I's and all the me's that Paul uses here in this passage. I, 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 me, me, me. Count them all up, and I'll save you just a little bit of time. The I's have it. Spirit puts up a big goose egg, right? This is life according to the flesh, under the power of sin. What it looks like to follow that misleading voice. Paul's conclusion here is, wretched man that I am. Right? Under the power of sin, according to the flesh... This is what it looks like, and it's a miserable way to live. Has anyone experienced that? Can anyone, can anyone agree? But hold on, his, his conclusion is coming, and it's pretty great. It's pretty encouraging. Verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus steps in on the scene, and he rescues us from the penalty of sin. Yes, from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin. This is it. He's come to deliver us. Set us free. Right? Set us free from that inner voice inside us that would mislead us and try to make us lead, lead that, that sinful life. He came to break the leash, break the bondage, break the chains, break us free from that misleading voice. So let's back up to Romans 6 one more time. Verse 6 in, in chapter 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. One more time, because it's, it's fun. <laughs> so that we would no longer be enslaved, it's freeing, enslaved to sin, no longer. Verse 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We've been set free. So for the last several years, I've been working in the mortgage industry, in one of those positions, it was this high, uh, assisting this high-producing loan officer. And he had been through like nine assistants in three years prior to me. And he was difficult to work for, right? He created this system that was built on past failures. So there was no, no step along the way, no entity, no department that was ever trusted to actually do their work. So my job really, it was double and triple work, making sure everybody else was doing their job. And it was the longest stretch ever, Right, pity parties tonight at eight. Um, <laughs> bring snacks. Uh, so uh, after a series of events, I ended up back in, um, in the same branch office, but I'm working with other loan officers. So I, I didn't have to work with him. And I walked back into that office to, to set up my desk and that same stress, right, hit me for a second. But then I realized, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm no longer a slave to Phil. He hated being called Phil, by the way. I've been set free. I'm a new employee. He doesn't have any control. Zero power over me. Now, imagine for a moment. Now, this never actually happened, but imagine if it had, he had come to my office and dropped off a big stack of files. That's just more visual. It's, it'd be a bunch of emails. It's, but big stack of files, and he, and he starts barking directives, right? I'd have a choice. I could get to work following his orders and working ridiculously, right, that, that cumbersome system that he had set up. Or I could say, I don't think so. This is not who I am anymore. I've been made new. I follow somebody else's lead. Right? I don't have to obey you as you try to reign over me to obey your evil <laughs> desires. Right? If you are in Christ, 
who you once were has been crucified with Christ. It's dead. It's buried. You've been raised to new life. You're a new person. You are in Christ. And you're no longer a slave to the power of sin. Listen, it does not say the power of sin was crucified. It says that you were crucified. The power of sin is still alive and it's still active and it's still annoying. It's that sneaky little misleading voice. But you're no longer beholden to it. You don't work for Phil anymore. You've been set free. That is the truth and it will change your life. Jesus has delivered you from the power of sin. I'm going to do it. I'm over. I'll apologize to the kids' workers later. So how do I know it's the Lord leading you? How do you know it's his leading voice? There's a couple quick things I want to say. It will never contradict what he's already said. It's never going to contradict the scripture. It's never going to contradict his word. Right? The character of God is laid out. We know who he is. We know who he says he is, and he's not going to change. The leading, his leading voice will never contradict scripture. If you, if you, and we're not going to turn there, but if you write it down, Galatians 5, it'll look a lot like the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's, that, that voice is going to sound a whole lot like that. Um, God is love. Write down 1 Corinthians chapter 13, because love is patient, it's kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not arrogant, it doesn't keep record of wrong, it doesn't want to have its own ways, it's not resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. It bears all things, hopes all things, believes all things. Number two, if it's good, it's God. Like there's, there's been times where I would uh, have a thought to send somebody a, a text saying, hey, I'm just thinking about you, praying for you. And I would start writing it out and then God would begin, that voice would begin to maybe say some specific things. And I would, I would shoot it off and it, it would change their day. They couldn't believe that a God was thinking about them and saw them where they were. If you think about people, call them, pick up the phone. If you're a millennial, send them a text, right? Like, do that. God is speaking to you. Position yourself to hear him. Encourage. If, they're, if he's dropping randomly, you start thinking about somebody that you haven't thought about and shouldn't be thinking about because this doesn't make any sense and it's a good thing, send it, say it. Encourage them. Even if you don't have, I was, I was just thinking about you, praying for you. It changed the day. I, 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 would, I would say to myself, I'm not going to miss God over money. So God, if you're calling me to give, I'm not going to miss you over a couple bucks. And he's like, okay. All right, God, I'm not going to miss you over a hundred bucks. Okay. All right, God, I'm not going to miss you over a thousand bucks. Okay. God, I'm not going to miss you over 3,000 bucks. Okay. God, I'm not going to miss you over a vehicle. Okay. And it begins to grow and you begin to trust. You begin to step out because you're hearing that voice and you begin to give, not because you have it, but because he has it and he has your heart. And you trust him and you begin to trust the leading of that shepherd that he's good. Number three, does it cause you to grow in your relationship? with Christ? Is what he's speaking to you, is what he's asking you to do, is it going to cause you to grow in your relationship? Because he's never going to ask you something that's not going to cause you to grow closer to him or in your relationship. And the fourth thing would be with others. Is it going to cause them, that encouragement you sent to them, that prayer, that whatever, is it going to cause them to grow in their relationship with God or develop a relationship with God or closer to God? So is, has he already said it? Is it, is it in his word? Is it good? Are you going to grow? Are they going to grow? Those are just a, a couple real quick things of hearing the voice of God, differentiating it from that misleading voice. Let me pray with you today. God, we recognize that you are good. God, that you, you, you've never known weakness. You are gracious and compassionate. You're slow to anger. You're rich in love. God, you... Your right arm is strength. You've never known defeat. God, we pray that we would hear your voice, that leading voice. God, that we would allow ourselves to be those who are led by you. God, that you would help us 
to understand and realize that this, the power of sin wants to rule and reign in our lives, but we are new and we made new and we are no longer under the sway, under the power of sin and the death that it wants to bring in us. Thank you that you have delivered us and you are delivering us from the power of sin. We don't have to obey. We don't have to let it rain. We don't have to obey its evil desires for our life. In Jesus' name. Would you guys stand to worship with us? Our old selves were crucified with him, amen. We're set free from the power of sin. You wouldn't let me stay a captive.
this up. Say thank you to him today. God, thank you. Lord, we thank you, God. You wiped us clean. You made us pure in God's sight. And Jesus, you are my deliverance from death to life, from dark to light. Jesus, you show me what freedom is. You call my name and you broke my shame. You are my deliverance. Would you go ahead and give the Lord a hand real quick for what he's done? Yeah, I was just telling Josh backstage when he walked off that um, so much of the truth that he was teaching us, um, it sort of goes against some of the things that I've been taught about myself, that I am just a sinner. And um, but we're not in Christ. We are the righteousness of God. It's so good. It's, if, we, if we begin to live our lives from that position alone, so I was telling him it probably felt weird preaching to a, the room. It feels like a funeral. Jared and Laramie are leaving, right? Gosh darn it. And yet we rejoice in what God has done through his son Jesus for us. And so it's, it's hard in that regard. It's also hard in, in, um, to let the Lord unpack the things in our, in our minds that we've been taught for so long. You're just a no good. You're just a this. You always do that. You're never going to change. And all of those things are lies. And the Lord loves you enough to send his son Jesus to prove it to you, to prove it to me. So I just want to pray for you one last time. We'll release you. Please don't forget to take a moment to fill out a thank you, miss you card for Miss Laramie and uh, Jared as well. God, we just thank you for our time. You are the life giver, the truth speaker. You're good, you're good all the time. God, help us to discern your voice, to know what you have for our lives. We look forward to this next week and even next year, God, as we begin to see the fruit of the spirit given to us by Jesus himself transform us day by day. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a great week. Take care.